Okay, we are recording. So welcome everyone to the uh, one hour session on designing your own 3D model rocket parts. Um, it's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart as the uh, president of the West Virginia Rocketry Association. Um, we are a, a club of the National Association of Rocketry and we're located in Morgantown, although we, we launch predominantly down in the, in the Fairmont area. And uh, that's where we have a, our own high power rocketry site where we can launch up to 7,000 foot ceiling now, which is cool. But the impetus for starting the club was to support the Team America Rocketry Challenge, now called the America Rocket, American Rocketry Challenge. And um, one of the things that we've been doing since the day we got our first 3D printer at NASA, which was probably about eight years ago now, um, is using the printer to design and print parts for model rockets. In fact, the very first part I ever printed on our Stratus is Uprint Plus, which is a, a really nice $40,000 printer, um, was a, a nose cone. And one of the punchlines uh, of the story is I called the company panicking because the nose cone didn't come out round. It had all these facets or little flat edges on it. And I, I told them that the printer didn't work right. And that was one of my first introductions to um, how to set your resolution when you're designing a part and creating your STL file. So we'll talk about that today. <laughs> um, because I've watched numerous rocketry teams do that same thing, that same error. So we'll try to alleviate that. Uh, so th the first thing I wanna um, just address, and I'd love to get your input as well, which is why do this? Like why even bother? Um, because you can buy parts from Apogee or other companies, you know, balsa fins, um, nose cones, bulkheads, centering rings, and everything that you could, you know, design, of course, you could just buy the part. Um, but when I've been working with teams for about, I want to say it's, it's almost 10 years now working with rocketry teams uh, and students, we start with, you know, our concept, we design our rocket in a simulation software package. Uh, we start modeling the performance of the rocket, you know, with various fin shapes and sizes and nose cone, you know, uh, shapes and, and different engines, and we get this, you know, high tech data out of our expected altitudes, thrust, peak velocities, apogee times, all this stuff. And then ultimately we end up taking balsa wood and cutting it with a, essentially a razor knife and sanding it with a, like a block of wood and, and, you know, sandpaper. And it just seems we went from super high tech to super low tech. Um, and I kept wanting to, to make that a little more uh, sort of analogous to what NASA engineers and, and other professional engineers are doing. Um, and that is they're, they're not, you know, going to the wood shop and, and getting out there, essentially their jigsaw and kind of rough cutting <laughs> something. They're, they're doing stuff a lot more sophisticated. So uh, 3D printing is one way to, to enhance the design process. Um, we also have a three axis router now um, at our makerspace at the NASA ERC. And so I've trained teams to use that tool to manufacture their parts, it's subtracting technology. We're gonna be focusing today on additive technology um, or additive manufacturing, which is when we're, we're adding material, in this case, to the 3D printing process. So um, also, once kids had their design, uh, then they were like printing out the templates and, and tracing those, those templates onto a, a piece of, of, of wood and cutting it out. And it, it seemed to me that this was a perfect opportunity to introduce them to a new topic or of computer aided design or CAD uh, and, and have them learn about the process of rapid prototyping and how it can be applied to their own designs. I've also found, and, and I don't know if this is true in your experiences or not, but I probably had hundreds of phone calls and emails, messages from schools that they have a 3D printer, but they're not sure what to do with it now. They've downloaded and printed files that they found on the internet, um, but they didn't know how to create their own files per se. That was, uh, you know, not not a skill that they had yet uh, developed. And so this gives you a reason to design and print your own custom parts. It's also one thing they love about training people to utilize 3D printers for rocket parts is generally speaking, these are really easy parts. You can get super complex. I've, we have some pretty amazing parts. One team in Morgantown designed their entire rocket except the body tube out of 3D parts 
The only problem was it was uh, basically at the, the weight limit. It was super duper heavy, but um, it was neat. It all threaded together. So they had like a, they glued a coupler in the bottom and threaded on their entire uh, fin and engine mount. And they had a coupler on the top and then they threaded on their nose cone. It was, it was, it was really high tech, but um, a little, a little overweight. Uh, but they were able to utilize a 3D printer effectively. Uh, one thing that always kind of fascinates me is I go online to, to websites, one of my favorite websites for ordering model rocket parts, Apogee Rockets. And um, the cost of ordering a bulkhead or something, it's not very expensive, you know, to get a, bul a balsa wood bulkhead or something, except by the time you add shipping and ordering, you know, you can print the part in an hour. It's going to take, you know, a week for you to get the part and the part plus the shipping is about the same price, if not sometimes more expensive to order it. So it's, it's, not, it's not a cost ineffective model. Um, one of the things that's happening right now is like we are 3D printing COVID face shields. That is cost, um, it's, it's not really cost effective. Uh, since you can print you know, one to like four of these things at a time, and it's just a, a part of the face shield. And anyway, it's, it's additive manufacturing is wonderful for prototyping and one-off and custom designs. It's not really designed for manufacturing. Um, in, a, in a big sense, because uh, it's so slow and relatively expensive to rotor molding and other techniques. But for what we're doing, it's perfect. Um, and the cost is very competitive. And one thing that I didn't know would be the case, but um, you can print 3D parts uh, and they will definitely hold up to the, the rigors of model rocketry. The, the biggest issue I think we normally have is which glue is the right glue to use to get the, the parts to adhere properly. So the, the overall process, um, and this to me is really important. Um, I don't want to begin with a CAD package and say, let's start from here. I always force the teams to do their homework first. Bust out a notebook, um, get your engineering notebook ready, and tell me about your rocket. It's a BT-70, a BT-80, it's a three-inch body tube. What are, you, what are you doing? You know, what are you building? Um, and then... I want to know what nose cone you know you want to have. Is it a parabolic? Is it an ogive shape? Um, you know how high is it going to be? And there'll be other limitations or constraints that come into play as well. Uh, how thick are your parts going to be? And um, I like to see their sketches, and I like to them to develop the skills of drawing sketches from a top side in a three-dimensional view. It's like a Called an isometric view. So here's a, you know, this is my coffee cup. So the isometric view would kind of be like a little, uh, pitched at an angle. And um, so one, once you've uh, printed your part, one of the keys I think to the engineering process, so in addition to teaching rocketry and rocket science, in addition to teaching CAD and rapid prototyping, we're teaching the process of engineering as well. And so we want them to document everything and make notes like, hey, the one millimeter thick uh, engine tube collapsed and broke. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't work. Let's use two millimeters you know, next time. Um, and that documentation really is critical to uh, helping them understand uh, the, the process and, and how it should work, the iterative design process. And my, my new thing I'm gonna unveil is that I created my own group on Thingiverse, they have Thingiverse groups and um, there's many rocket parts already shared on Thingiverse. And it's not the only place to share 3D parts, but it's, I have, a, I have we, the ERC owns four MakerBots. So by default, I had to create a account um, with MakerBot, which is also the same company that manages the, the Thingiverse. And so um, what was new though, last week was preparing for this workshop. I, I created our, our own group. We could start sharing parts in there. So it gives one place to try and capture all these, these neat things that people are, are designing. So when we talk about design requirements, um, and by the way, anytime you want, um, I have the chat box open. I'll try to remember to look at it. Um, and yeah, Gary, Gary mentioned, you know, mechanical drawing um, is, is a skill, um, despite the fact that computers can now do that for us and even uh, Fusion 360 and most of the CAD packages have a, uh, an option where they'll take whatever you design and put it in a mechanical drawing view for you. 
I still believe that in order to communicate your idea and to demonstrate your own spatial awareness and develop that skill if you don't have it, being able to draw three-dimensional objects from different angles and perspectives is, is critical to the students being able to, to effectively utilize uh, these tools. But um, so we're gonna build a rocket today that is a, a, based on a BT-80, which is a, a standard name that Estes came up with for a, a body tube that happens to be 65 millimeters inside and 66 millimeter outside diameter. We're gonna put a 29 millimeter motor in it. Um, I, part of my belief is you should, if you're building a TARC rocket, you might end up using a 29, you might end up using a 24 millimeter motor. You don't know. But if you build a 24 millimeter motor mount system, you can only use 24 millimeter motors. <laughs> uh, and you can't predict what motors will be available. So go with a 29 and then print an adapter. And so that way you can always step it down and run smaller engines if you need to. Um, we're gonna do some centering rings um, uh, as well. And we're going to, uh, in addition, do a nose cone and a bulkhead. And we'll see how much time we have. I think that, that might, we might run out of time at that point, but um, we can get much more advanced. We have some really sexy designs that um, we've worked on to hold electronic payload bays. It's a little beyond the TARC experience. Uh, we did it in our small satellites for secondary students, S4, um, which we renamed uh, Sounding Rockets for All Students, I believe, um, that our rocketry club and NASA has been running for several years. By the way, the current evolution of that camp was released last night. If you're on our listserv, you may have seen a, um, an email I sent out about destination space which is going to be a three-year initiative, essentially, with the culminating experience on the third summer of students actually building um, a small satellite payload that can be launched into uh, suborbit. So um, in any event, that's, that's kind of a, a building on what we've been doing in the past with that. But um, so you, r rather than sketching these things out, I kind of jotted all the details down. But, one limitation you need to, to know about too is your, uh, your printer itself. So know, know your printer. Um, it's kind of like saying I'm gonna build, you know, a skateboard ramp and it's gonna be 50 feet long or, you know, 15 feet wide or whatever. But you, you remember that your plywood comes in four by eight sheets. So you, you might wanna make it 12 feet wide and, you know, 64, some, some other, you know, common denominator of, of the dimensions of the materials you have, but in this case, it's, you know, my printer can only print six inches high. So if I go beyond that, it's not gonna, not gonna go in there unless I print it diagonally and that creates its own issues. So without further ado, um, ask any questions while I shift gears and share my um, other screen. So um, in terms of dimensions to be concerned about um, with things like the MakerBot um, printer, for example, uh, actually is a rectangular build envelope. So I think it has eight inches uh, in one direction, six in the other and six high. And so your, act, like your actual longest measurement would be a diagonal of 12 something inches. But uh, printing a object that's hollow uh, along a, a, a diagonal axis like that laying down on its side wouldn't work so well. So that's, that's where you have to understand 3D printing um, and, and take that into consideration when you're designing your part because it's, it's definitely easy to design something that you can't print. Um, a fancier printer, so I have, um, I have an ABS printer at the Makerspace at the ERC it's uh, the dimension U Print Plus. It has two print heads, one for support material, one for model material. That printer can print in any direction I want. I can print this nose cone sideways, upside down, at a funny 400 degree angle. It'll print support material to hold it up and to fill in uh, where it needs to so that the print head can do the model material in any uh, angle. It has something to print onto a surface. Um, in contrast, the MakerBots, they, they'll try to do support-ish plastic, but they don't have a separate plastic head um, or filament. And so uh, you have to just break everything out. 
and it's not going to do as effective a job. It won't do a, as nice a job printing something sideways. So I like to always orient my nose cones, for example, straight up and down with the opening facing down. And that produces the, the, uh, the best print, the best quality print, um, and the most efficient print because if you had to print support plastic, you just doubled the increase of your time of your job and the cost of your job because now you're printing, you're filling that whole nose cone up with, with fill material in order to print solid apart on the outside. So that was probably a, lo a long explanation, but um, each printer is different. I was working with um, East Fairmont High School and they have a, a printer that has uh, like an eight inch uh, high print envelope. So it, it was nicer than, than the one I have. Okay, so I just pulled up a, a nose cone that I designed previously. Um, and let's just go ahead and start with this by looking at you know, the, the parts of it. So on the bottom, uh, I'm gonna close this little window over here. On the bottom of the Fusion 360 window is a toolbar that allows you to go back in time and examine all of your parts and all of your features that you added to it. So for example, if I looked at this nose cone and I said, gosh, you know, the shoulder is a little too high, a little too, too much shoulder there. I didn't want that much of a shoulder. I can go back in time to the sketch, double click that, I'm in the sketching tool and I can make adjustments there to that dimension if I wanted to. And actually I can see that I have a whole one millimeter thick dimension than a lip there. Technically speaking, the, uh, the lip on our paper body tube is only half a millimeter, but in my mind, uh, it's okay to have that stick out a little bit and you can just brush that with some sandpaper if you want, but I definitely want to have it stop and not slide in. So I err, and these are little, little things I learned along the way. I erred this out of caution there, but you can make some adjustments in here. And those adjustments would be immediately represented um, in your final design. Um, I could also double check um, the shelling I did. Maybe the nose cone ended up being uh, too brittle or too heavy. I might say, gosh, this nose cone is great, but I'm, I'm overweight. So what I could do uh, in this case is you can see the, the thickness of the wall is two millimeters. I could change that to 1.5, okay, and so now that just made the thickness of the wall less and everything else should be fine. And so I could cut some weight that way and see if that, that's strong enough for the demands of, of what we're doing. But I can save a version. So let's begin with the simplest design. So in the, in the little PowerPoint we had earlier, um, I think the first object that we're going to design is going to be uh, a, actually let's begin with the, uh, the coupler. So one of the things that you need to build a model rocket that's going to be a payloader is something to hold the payload bay and the booster together. Um, you can just buy a paper tube, which is very cheap, but then you still need to have a bulkhead. You still need to glue that in. You still need to have anchor points. There's a whole lot more involved in it. We can accomplish all that in one fell swoop, essentially. Um, and it's, it's very straightforward. So I have a new part. I'm gonna click on my sketching tool. I'm gonna click on any one of these work planes I want. So I'm gonna choose base work plane. I still wanna figure out which feature I disabled because it used to spin around um, to the work plane that I just clicked on. And in this case, we're gonna choose a center diameter circle. I'm gonna to go to the origin, I snap to the origin, I drag and Todd's quick tip is don't click your mouse button the second time, manually type in the dimension you want. So what I'm doing here is I'm using the actual inside dimension of the body tube for the outside dimension of my uh, coupler. For, mo for, for most printers, this is working just fine for me. It may end up being a little bit too big. Um, if so, you could easily go back and call it 64.9. 
um, or a little bit of sandpaper on it might, might be uh, warranted. But you're gonna glue half of this into your um, payload bay and the other half is gonna slide in and out of your, your body tube. So this is probably a, a good measurement for us to use for now. So I press enter, I have a 65 millimeter circle. I finish it. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to add a feature to this. And the feature is the one that's already, it's one of the, it's the first feature highlighted on the top of the menu bar, it's called extrude. If I click on the create drop down. I can see that I have extrude, revolve, sweep, loft, all these different options here. But extrude is so commonly used that it's a, a button. So I click extrude. The software is now asking me to identify which profile I want to extrude. So if it's not already highlighted, I would click on the shape that I just made. And uh, in our dimensions uh, earlier, we wanna have at least an inch of, of that coupler sliding into the payload bay and an inch that we use for joining our two rockets. So it should be about two inches, but we're not allowed to use inches. Uh, you have to use millimeters. So 25.4 millimeters per inch. Um, so I'm gonna say basically it's, it's, it's 50 millimeters just for convenience sake. So I'm gonna extend this out 50 millimeters and say, okay. So now I've created a cylinder. Uh, problem is this would be a solid chunk of plastic. It would weigh a ton, very strong, but um, probably not very reasonable for a model rocket. When you buy a bulkhead, by, by the way, they, they do sell coupler bulkheads um, from commercial sites, but it's a giant chunk of also it just a solid chunk. So what I'm gonna do now is any surface I click on will become the new work plane, the new area from which I am choosing to work from. So I'm gonna click on this top uh, of my cylinder and now I'm going to look not at create, but my next section of tools called modify. And modify, we can press and pull, we can round edges, we can camfer the edges, or shell a solid. So that's the one we want. We're gonna shell a solid. So I've already chosen my surface. If I hadn't chosen the surface, it would ask me to do that at this point, but I preempted it. Here's where we can define our thickness. Um, because this is gonna also be the bulkhead and take some pretty significant forces, the cheap and easy way for me to do this uh, is just to give it a, a thickness of about three millimeters. It's gonna make a very chunky, pretty darn heavy part. Um, that's one option that we could do. So let's go ahead and say three millimeters thick. You could, you could try to make it thinner, but you're going to, you're going to struggle with the, the forces of the ejection and separation and parachutes all going to mount to the bottom of this. So that's the safe thing to do. So I now have essentially created my coupler. It's not tall enough. Again, I want to just demonstrate this. Um, I'm going to go down on the timeline to my sketch and I can adjust the sketch if I wanted. In this case, if it, well, I'm sorry, if it was too thick for, or too large, for example, it wouldn't fit inside my body tube, I could easily adjust it here. Um, if it wasn't tall enough, I could go to the next item, which is the feature called extrude on my timeline and say, you know what? I really wanna make this 60 millimeters. And so now it's, it's, it's larger. I, I wanted to demonstrate that intentionally because this is the power of parametric modeling. Um, I could easily change my dimensions based on data that I got. Oh, this isn't really big enough. Um, this is too thick to whatever. So that's easy to change. So uh, that's your basic coupler. I want to show you the same thing, but I want to do it a different way. I'm gonna call it a BT80 coupler. So let's just say we are starting over again. We're gonna sketch, work plane. I don't know why it doesn't turn. We're gonna do our circle. 
Let me get 65 millimeters. Finish our sketch in the top right. Extrude that thing out. We're gonna make it uh, 60 millimeters tall. So we're done. But this time I wanna have thinner walls and a thicker bulkhead. So I'm clicking on the top of this cylinder, to make a work plane. And now I'm gonna do another sketch. And it should have turned like this. I feel like 20 minutes trying to figure out why my, what, what setting I disabled that doesn't let it, let it turn. I'm gonna draw another circle now. So if we know we have a 65 millimeter diameter circle, and I wanna make my walls say, I don't know, one and a half millimeters thick. So we're gonna have one and a half millimeters on either side of our 65, so that's three millimeters. So 65 minus three is 62. So I'm good at math. So I'm gonna drag it a little bit, type 62, and I've created a circle at 62 millimeters diameter. Enter, finish my sketch. So there is a circle on top of my cylinder. At this point, I'm gonna hit the extrude button. I'm gonna identify, because now there's more than one surface. There's several different surfaces I could click on. So the software can't automatically assume. And at this point, it's saying, click on whichever surface you need to extrude. So I'm gonna click on this inner circle. By default, the software assumes I'd like to add material, creating a new body, which actually, if I start to do this up, it's gonna say join. So it's now creating a new body material. It's, it's essentially attaching as one solid piece, but I don't want to do that. I'm going to drag into the piece. And in doing so, the operation automatically changes to cut. And so it's removing material now. So extrude is very powerful. And that's kind of one of the, one of the things I wanted to, to point out to you here. Now, I, want, I still want to have a three millimeter thick bulkhead down there. So I know that the entire height is 60 millimeters. So the length that we're gonna go is negative 57. And that's gonna be a three millimeter thick bulkhead. Hit okay. So now I have a slightly more advanced, slightly more nuanced, if you will, uh, coupler bulkhead that allows me to have thinner walls, cutting some weight, but maintain the thickness in the area that I really wanted to have it. So down at the bottom, it's a little, a little thicker. And it's hard to see that you can change your view. Uh, down here, there are different views. For example, I might wanna have wire frame and I can see the thickness down there a little better. Standard is just shaded. Uh, another thing I could do just for giggles, since I'm, I'm having fun here, is I could rotate my part around, find the bottom of my part, highlight that bottom edge, and modify. We have an option called fillet or rounding the edges. So I can now choose the radius of the circle, if there would be a circle that was extended around um, for the fillet. And so um, I've already chosen my edge. So here's where I can define it. And if I, if I zoom in, you can use that handle to drag. So I could do it too much, that'd be bad, but just a teeny bit of fillet. And uh, we are talking probably like a one millimeter. So I'm almost like I'm sanding the edges. Uh, again, the other point is you can get more sophisticated with your designs. Um, and so now what we have is the same part, but a little, a little nicer. The, the edges are, are rounded, so it's gonna slide in and out because that's the part that slides in and out of our um, booster. I could similarly camper the edge um, because we're going to be sliding parts in and out of this, this area. So the outside edge will be glued to the body tube, but the inside edge is just going to be 
a lip that we catch on. And I hate when I catch on that lip. Personally, it's kind of annoying. So if I can zoom in a little bit and catch just the inside lip of my part, I can go to modify and then we have a camphor option, which is a, a angled cut. So there should be a little handle that I can drag. You can see I can get that camphor edge to make it a smoother transition when I'm shoving like a, an egg holder or something down inside there. So it's a, right now it's a one millimeter, but I should make it 1.5 if I wanna go to the edge. If I type that in, hit okay. So again, necessary, no, cool, yes. So we have a more sophisticated uh, coupler bulkhead. We'll save this. And I like to always use a naming convention that tells me what part it is. Um, and on this part, let's go ahead and take it to the next step. Uh, and that is to get this to our 3D printer. I don't want to forget that step and run out of time. So essentially, I'm going to go over to the uh, file dropdown. It's a little dog-eared piece of paper. And there's an option called 3D print. Um, the, the sucker is that you always want to go for the export, and that's wrong. In this version of software, it's the 3D print button. And when I hit that, um, I love to have the preview mesh on, although I can hear my, my, uh, my laptop is starting to, to smoke, the fan's running. Uh, this is a little intense what we're doing in terms of the, the graphics and stuff. But um, I mentioned earlier that I had inadvertently printed out a nose cone, my very first print job, that had all kinds of edges and facets on it. And that was not ideal. And so that was because I had my refinement set to low. We're going to turn off send 3D print utility. I'm doing that because in this course, I have no idea which printer you're using. You could be using a Bosch, a LUTzbot a MakerBot, a Uprint, I don't know. And so because of that, I'm going to uh, just make sure we output as an STL file. Um, and so nothing's happened because I didn't select the part yet. So that, that top option is not done. So I click on the part and you can see it shows me these little, these triangles and there'll be little flat edges all around this. This part would not slide smoothly into my rocket body tube. This would be bad. So I'm gonna choose high resolution. And you'll see the number of triangles increase. So we're now using 5,700 triangles. Here we're using 844 triangles. So why do, why do I care? Um, a higher resolution part, just like a higher resolution photo, is a larger file. It takes more time for your printer software to process. It takes, it's just, it, it's a more complex part um, in that sense. And so um, if I'm putting multiple parts onto a 3D print tray, I've actually had the software that manages the printer crash if I had lots of high resolution um, parts on there. You're really never gonna have that happen with the rocket parts you're building, but I just wanted to explain why we care. Hit okay. It now gives me a separate file entirely. And this is where I'm gonna rename it again. This is my, my cool DT80 bulkhead coupler. So I've saved that part. And just to like wrap up the, the concept here, I'm gonna launch the MakerBot software and show you how that part comes in to the software that manages the, the printer, the slicing and layering, and um, uh, get your part ready to go. So I'm waiting for that software to launch. I have to wait. Share. Okay, there it is. I tried too quickly to share it. So I'm now sharing the MakerBot software. Anyone can just chat in the, type in the chat box. You can see the MakerBot print software. That'd be great. So I know that we're on the same page here. Great. Thanks, Emma. So um, what we have over here 
is the add files button or add new models. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on add model. I'm gonna to go to the desktop and there is my cool BT80 bulkhead coupler part. I'm gonna add that. Okay, apparently um, MakerBot wanted to do a software update in the middle of this. this is weird, I just used it last week and it didn't need that. Now, this is the part where I think it's critical for everyone to understand that our printers have limitations. So uh, in other words, um, I could attempt to print the part like this, but this is hollow. And if I did that, the printer would attempt to fill underneath of this with scaffolding up to the edge here by halfway and the entire part get filled with um, support material. Uh, it would make the part potentially unusable. Plus twice as expensive, plus um, twice as slow. So how do I do this properly? With a part like this, I'm gonna position the bottom down. MakerBot has a feature where I can actually click on a surface and then orient it. So it says place, place face and build plate. So I click on that button. It says, okay, select the face of your part. I'm gonna choose that. And that is the bottom. And now it rotated my part. That's one way to do it. So my part is now down on my build tray. If I have multiple parts for my rocket teams, I can move this part around. And um, I can position everything I want on here before I hit my, before I hit print. And then the last thing that's kind of fun to do is um, do an estimate and print preview. I just think this is cool to, to see. So how long will this part take? How much plastic will it use? Again, good things that you need to be aware of. You need to understand the limitations of your device when it comes to the manufacturing part. Yeah, so supports, um, if it does do supports um, or, or basically support plastic inside here, you try to snap it all off. And it, it, it usually it's pretty good, um, but it would definitely require some um, post print, you know, sanding and, and work. So our preview is generated. Now it's parsing the toolpath, which means it's gonna write the CNC code, the Z code it's called, to tell the printer when to go forward, left, right, and how much plastic to extrude or, or squirt out at that time. Um, and, and so this is the actual pathways. And so you can see it doing it right now. So I have something called rafting turned on. It's gonna print the support material um, underneath and that's gonna print um, all of our build material up. So here's the animation, support material, build material. And it would take three, four hours essentially. And it's gonna use 35.7 grams of plastic. So I just wanna show you that how that, how that works. And uh, you can slim, skim through any, any layer you want as you do this. Anyway, um, any questions about taking a part that I designed making an STL or stereolithography file and bringing it into your print management software. Okay, either that was super clear or I don't know, maybe uh, I got muted by accident, but I'm gonna jump back to the um, 3D printing software. It's a fusion in this case. And if someone could confirm that you can see fusion, that'd be great. Great, thank you. Um, so let's talk about the other parts really quick. So a bulkhead's an awesome, really functional part. Um, you could attach an eye bolt in the bottom of it. Um, I actually usually punch two little holes in the bottom of my bulkhead and run a piece of Kevlar cord or some strong cordage through there and I use that as my anchor point for attaching parachutes, uh, shock cords, et cetera. So um, you could also attach a U-bolt. You can buy them at Lowe's or you know, Home Depot or something. 
a, a, a U-bolt, thin, tiny little U-bolt with a metal plate. That's probably the strongest. Add some weight, but it's, it creates this really nice metal anchor point uh, for you. I have examples of all this at my office, which I can't get into. Okay, so we're gonna make a new design. Um, I started with not the easiest thing. Let's, let's go to something the easiest, which is gonna be our, one of our easiest, a engine tube. So we're gonna basically draw a circle and let's do the inner diameter first. The engine that we're gonna use is a 29 millimeter engine. Now, I wanted my fit to be tight and snug with a, a little bit of sanding, I can could, I could make it a little smoother and, and to come in and out if I need to, to release, for example, the coupler. But when I make um, the tube, the engine tube, I have to have the engine easily slide in and out. And the engine has some paper sticker on it and stuff. So I cannot make the inter, inner dimension of my engine tube the same as my engine. I have to make it a little bit bigger. So I'm going to make this 29.1 millimeters teeny bit larger intentionally so that my part can fit in. I'm gonna put in the circle tool, draw another circle. And now the question is, what is the thickness of our walls? And I did define this earlier. We're gonna do 1.5 millimeter thick walls. So 1.5 on each side, we're gonna add three. So that's gonna be uh, 29, 30, 31, 32, 32.1 uh, millimeters, 2.1. So now I have two circles, finish my sketch. At this point, um, hopefully this is becoming second nature. Extrude, it does not know what I want to extrude. So the software is held, held off at this point. I choose that area between the two circles. And I like to make my engine tubes at least 100 millimeters uh, long. Okay. and. So that was it. I made my engine tube. Pretty straightforward. It's important to know your dimensions though, otherwise the next parts won't work. So now we're gonna add some centering rings to this engine tube. So sketcher, work plane. Todd's extra step right there. And I'm gonna draw two circles again. Now I want a tight fit on the body tube. So it's a 65 millimeter interior diameter. So I'm gonna do a 65. And I want a tight fit on the engine tube as well. So I do an interior circle. I'm snapping to the origin. I drag it out. Remember it was 32.1 was the outside dimension of my engine tube. That's going to be the inside dimension of my centering ring. Again, worst case scenario, they're a little snug. In a, a couple of quick passes with some sandpaper and it's perfect. But if I made it too big, it, I can't add more plastic dock. I'm trying to add glue to fill it in. It's not going to work. So we finished our sketch. And um, how thick should we make this? In my experience, three millimeters is a great thickness for centering ring. Uh, more than that's great if you want, but you're going to be adding extra weight. If you need weight, you could do that. Um, I think that two millimeters is probably pushing it. So I'm going to click on the area I want to extrude. I'm going to give it a distance of three millimeters and we're done. So that's the, that's our centering ring. Now I want to save the, the most exciting part uh, for last and that's the nose cone. So uh, let's see. Gary asked, how about adding an eye bolt to 3D? Yeah, so we could definitely add more. I've, I've done that before. I've intentionally added another part on the bottom of my coupler that had a attachment point. The reason I shy away from getting my parts too complex when I'm initially teaching students is um, two, twofold. One, I've had that part snap off. Um, a 3D printed attachment point you know, um, in theory, it could be strong, but it depends on how you design it. Two, it's going to make my print job a lot longer. It's going to take uh, a longer time to, uh, to print support plastic underneath and make it's more complex. Um, not a bad idea. Definitely should explore it. 
but I found that in certain cases, it's better to add some hardware um, or keep it simple. It's my KISS principle. Keep it super simple. All right, so uh, now the nose cone. And this is fun. And the most advanced part of the, the technical design part. So we're going to go ahead and create a new sketch. I'm going to work on the front work plane this time. And I'm gonna go to my drawing tools and I'm gonna use the line creation tool. And here's where your dimensions that you came up with earlier are important, plus you have to divide everything by two. And that, that doesn't make sense now, it will in a second. So uh, first thing I wanna, wanna, wanna note is that the height of my printer comes into play right now. So I know that my, uh, my printer uh, maxes out at a little, a little more than six inches. So I can't make my nose come more than six, including the shoulder. And that happens to be 154.4 millimeters. So we want to leave a little bit of extra space for the raft. So let, let's go ahead and say we're not going to go over 150 millimeters maybe for the entire um, nose cone. So I'm going to draw a line right now. Oops, I inadvertently clicked. I'm gonna click on the line tool, draw a line from 150 straight down to the origin. It all snaps on, it's really easy, okay? So now I have a line that gives me my maximum dimension of my rocket. Now the next part is the part of the nose cone that slides into my body tube. So we know the interior dimension of my body tube is 65 millimeters. I'm only gonna draw half of that. So that's gonna be, 32.5. So I start dragging this out, and then again, I'm gonna type in 32.5 rather than try and move my mouse the exact amount. So now I have a line, I should have a line right there. Let's draw the line. I'm not sure I got the line. Thirty-two point five millimeters. Enter. There it is. So I have that. Now the shoulder. I want it to go in about an inch. Not exactly. It doesn't have to be even an inch. Um, and I, I apologize for sw sw swapping units on you here, but that should be about uh, twenty-five point four millimeters. So I'm going to draw another line, snapping on the end of that one line. And going up, I'm going to say 25 millimeters. Enter. So I have a new line. Now, I'm going to zoom in a lot to this next part. I lost my part. Hold on. I'm gonna, have a, I'm gonna click the zoom to fit button. I'm gonna zoom in straight in this little area. So with two fingers on my touchpad, I can drag. And with two fingers, I can pinch and zoom. So with this part, I'm gonna make it one uh, millimeter in diameter. And it says that that one is 4.5. So uh, we're going to go ahead and I think I'm just going to, at a convenient sake, just delete that part. So I highlighted, I deleted it. I inadvertently drew it. So my line tool, snap to here, and I'm going to go one millimeter out. That's it. The actual dimension of the body tube is a half millimeter. So that's good. Where's my line? One millimeter. There it is. Now, this is the part that's a lot of fun. I'm going to connect that lip and that top of my nose cone. I'm going to use another drawing tool called an arc. My favorite one to use is called the three point arc. You can get any shape you want depending upon which 
arc tool you use, but I find this to be easy for what I'm going to try and do, which is an ogive shape. So it's a pointed but rounded top. So I click once on the top of my nose cone. I click once on that bottom with my little lip sticks out. And my third click defines the shape of the arc. This is where I can, that would not be a, a very convenient nose cone. So here I can dictate the shape based on where that third point goes. So I can place it there. And now I can finish my sketch. So what I've created is essentially a profile of half of my nose cone. Why? Because now we're going to use a feature called Revolve. So if Extrude's popular, Revolve's the second most popular feature. I choose that. The software only sees one profile, so it already selected the profile. Okay, but it's waiting for me to identify the axis. The axis is long axis of the nose cone. Once I click on that, it's going to project in 360 degrees around. If you're thinking, what just happened? I love to do this. I love to take this little handle and, and watch essentially the software design my 360 degree part. Okay, so we'll make that 360 degrees. Then a full nose cone. I create a new material and we hit OK. Now, we're going to do something that we did earlier. I'm going to go to the bottom of this nose cone. So we're back where we started the entire class. I'm going to click on the bottom of that. I'm going to look at my modify options. And one of them is called shell solid. To define the thickness of my walls, I'm going to go with two millimeter thick walls. And I hit OK. And I have now made uh, a 3D printed model rocket nose cone um and uh the next step would just be this save it off save it as a stl file so you can bring it into your 3d printing software so i just glanced the clock and and that is uh what we define as a time for the class uh since i am i don't have anything else uh in terms of workshops for the rest of the day i'm happy to stay and answer any questions but uh we'll go ahead and see if there's any other questions you have right now, and then I'll end the uh, recording. Good stuff, Todd. Sure. Thanks again. Okay, I'm gonna.